Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> and um, we've been discussing this contrast between Christ or between Jesus as the Lamb and the law. And that's the, the name of the class is actually Law and Grace. Um, and whoever keeps putting a plus in between there, it's, not, it's never law plus grace. Never. Uh, but we are studying law and we're studying grace. Uh, and then I write in parentheses uh, law and lamb. <clears throat> We've been seeing, seeing the uh, first part of Matthew in light of Jesus as the lamb of God. And um, we've been endeavoring to look at uh, the Beatitudes, which, thank God, we'll get to the first one now. Um, so let's read verse 1, 2, and 3 of Matthew 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Uh, and let's just read down a little more. Blessed are the, they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let's just stop with that right there. All right, so... <clears throat> Last class, anybody remember we're talking about the logos? And, uh, and we studied that a little further to see that the logos really was the Lamb of God, that the logos was the complete thought and concept of God, but the Lamb fulfills that, fulfills all of that. And... Um, uh, and so here we mentioned in that last class that here we have Jesus, and he's, his, this is his first large audience. And, um, you know, the other one really being um, uh, like at the wedding of Cana and stuff like that. But this, this has got a bunch of people. And... So this is Jesus' really first sermon or presentation of whoever he is, whatever this is about, we're going to hear it now. You know, you hear rumors, well, he said this to somebody, or he was at that wedding at Cana, but this one is going to be the one where he sets forth. All right. Now, I want to I contrast, if you will, in our minds the contrast that we have of Jesus um, in relationship to, excuse moi in relationship to the Jesus that we know, uh, the, the Jesus that is known basically among Christians, <laughs> the Christian Jesus. Um, <clears throat> by the way, Jesus isn't a Christian. Well, he's not. <laughs> no, he's not. You know, he didn't join that religion. <clears throat> um, he, the, um, in our comprehension, to, just to be honest, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to formulate this. In our comprehension of Jesus and of what he came to do, and what he really represents, and who he is, and his purpose for coming, Jesus, at this first showing and sermon, it's very large, actually, it goes a bunch of chapters here, he would, if, if it was, in the image that we understand, Jesus would have come and sat on that mountain and he would have said, um, he probably would have said something like this, well, I'm gonna die 
and then there's going to be a great victory. And don't worry, it's not going to be much longer. You know, I'm just starting my ministry, so we've got three and a half years, so be cool. You know, chill for a little while, because it's going to work out. And you're going to be victorious. And this is going to be the biggest victory that has ever come. And people start growing, the crowd start growing with, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and if you follow me, then you will go to heaven and, and God will do great things in your life. And, and the Lord will, anyway, no, it's somebody else. If anybody thought he was the Messiah, these, this sermon, these Beatitudes, would look so stupid in light of, you know, what, what they thought was coming. Which, by the way, is similar to the Christian concept. The Jewish concept was the Messiah was going to come and he was going to defeat Rome and he was going to defeat all the enemies and they would live victorious and rule and reign. Is that right or wrong? That was okay. Well, that's kind of a, a, a Christian concept of Jesus. He's come, he's defeated all enemies, he rule and reign, and everything's going to be, you know, we're going to reign as kings and, you know, on the earth and. But he doesn't mention any of that. He doesn't, this is his big chance to get their attention. Hey, you know, I'm going to share stuff with you that's going to make you want to follow me. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are you when all men shall speak evil of you. Come on. That, you know, and to start that way, to start that way. This is, I'd like to present basically what I'm about. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Well, he, now, we know that he is presenting what he's all about. <laughs> but if people if, if Jesus had showed up to let's just say that about a um, hundred years in to Jesus having come and died and everything and he showed back up like for two weeks And he started saying, you know, I just want to adjust things a little bit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the, you know. When, when Charlemagne took off to, to conquer the Muslims that were in Jerusalem to take back Jerusalem, the Holy Land, that's what they call it. Um, he, if Jesus had a showed up then and said, no, I don't want you to kill them, I want you to die, and blessed are you if you're persecuted for being a Christian. And to lay down your life, because life comes out of death, you know. And all these guys got swords and banners, and yeah, ah, they've been worked up into a frenzy. They're ready to, to die for their savior. Of course, their real goal is to make them die for our savior. <laughs> you know. Jesus hadn't put on any airs. Um, he, he has been put in, a, in some circumstances 
like the wedding of Cana, and that beforehand, his mom comes to him and says, look, they're out of wine. Do something. You know, something big. Impress them. I mean, give them wine, but let them all know that, you know. And Jesus' words were, my hour is not yet come. Does anybody know what hour he's talking about? Raise your hand if you know. Okay, three of you. Amen. We're in trouble. <laughs> when Jesus said, my hour has come, he was talking about the cross. Okay? So, so here it is at the early part of his ministry, and she says, do a miracle. And he goes, my hour has not yet come. The miracle I want to do isn't this. But he's a lamb, and, and you check it out throughout different times. He has to say, mine hour is not yet come, meaning that's not what I'm really here for. But he goes ahead and does it anyway because he's a lamb. Does that make sense? That he would do that? Because, you know, if that's really his spirit, then he's going to go, all right. Mom, what do I have to do with thee? You know. So here he sits. He's Carpenter's son. That's basically what he's known as. And he's not trying to convince anybody he's God. He's not trying to convince anybody that they should follow him. He's not trying to hint to them the greatness that's about to come or the greatness that you're about to have because you become Christians. You know, the greatness that y'all all are experiencing in your lives. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that kind of greatness, see. I mean, you, you can't get any greater than Jesus. Greater, you know, if you want greatness, greater is he that's in you. <laughs> than you or me. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. And that's my kind of greatness, Jesus being greater than me. That's, that sounds good to me. So Jesus starts, and he doesn't go, you know, he doesn't say, now, I really... I'm, you know, he didn't go down the line. He didn't, I really want you to be a praying people. Okay. You got to pray. You got to be a praying people. You got to be a praying people. He didn't even start with prayer, come to think of it. He didn't go, bow your heads, omnipotent Father. He, he didn't, he just sat down when he was said, he opened his mouth, this is what we just read, and said what he had to say. He didn't say, now, you're going to have this big task. We're going to unite together as a force for God. And we're going to win people to the Lord. And salvation shall go throughout the land. What well, did, but read the book of Acts. They were persecuted and outcasts and kicked out of families and, and the temple and what have you. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Uh, happy are you. Happy should you be. <clears throat> um, he doesn't say, We're, you will one day see buildings all over the world with steeples. I, I know, calm down people. <laughs> uh, he didn't say there'll be hymn books. He didn't say there's gonna be, he didn't say almost anything that we would put in the category of a major basic thing that we're about. He brought up what he thinks we're about. 
And the first thing out of his mouth, the first thing out of his mouth has nothing to do with a ministry or work. It has to do with your spirit. Your spirit. The spirit in which you do everything. That's what it has to do. It doesn't have to do, you know, because uh, there are Christians accomplishing all kind of stuff and their spirit isn't right. And, you know, I can say I'm the chief of sinners. I mean, I, it has to be his spirit in us, but his spirit is not, you know, I mean, we, we say, well, we will, you know, we conquer by Jesus. And yes, we do, but we're more than conquerors. And it says right there, we are killed all the day long. You're more than conquerors. Here's what you do. You're a continual sacrifice unto God, just like the Old Testament shadow. You are the real. You know? So he's real happy about what he's got to say here. You know, I'm sure you've seen that movie where it shows the crowd way, way in the back and the camera's on a couple of people so far back that they, they can't hear. And Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. And one of them turns to the other one and says, what did he say? And the other guy says, blessed are the cheesemakers. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes we get that far off <laughs> from what he's trying to say to us. We miss what he's really trying to say. And what he's trying to say is, there is no need for me to talk about any other subject until you realize that having your spirit right is everything. I see Lindsay sitting up there looking at me going, well, this ain't right. You've got to start with your spirit being right. <laughs> and, and the right spirit isn't to put down those things that we talked about. The right spirit is to do what he said, and it will bring a contrast to everything that works for him or uses his name. Because it will be a sweet savor unto the Father. It'll be Christ in us, who we bear about the dying of the Lord Jesus daily in our mortal bodies. Well, what does that mean? It means that there's a spirit that the Lord wants to see that we would not be able to define until we know it. The reason why I say that is, you know, how many times does Jesus say stuff, you know, or do stuff that you go, I ain't the right spirit, you know, the fig, the fig tree, you know, the fig tree, remember that? And he came there, no figs on it. He said, curse it or you. I mean... I would have turned to Jesus and said, dude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Remember that? First thing ever out of your mouth to us. You know, it's about having the right spirit. Well, that's what I say. We don't understand that because he is a contrast to everything else. And he doesn't have to be mean to be that contrast, but it is a contrast and it's, and it's supposed to contrast. There's supposed to be a contrast. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are lowly in heart. Poor in spirit. The app, it's the exact opposite of being puffed up, of um, becoming something. And you find people that, I'm sure there were people that were sitting there before Jesus going, look, this is all well and good, but we, there's, you know, we're hungry for God. We want to know some deep answers to 
the scriptures. Tell us the meaning of, you know, that verse. And he's going, no, that's not, I don't, you know, we start with the spirit. We start with your spirit. We start with you being with me or with you being with you. You being of another spirit. And you remember Paul did say that. It's another spirit. I wrote, but we need to start with finding out and obtaining the right spirit in everything. It's not first about what we accomplish in ministry or what we know concerning right doctrine. It is about what spirit it is and what spirit what we do is done in. Not works, not working, not doing, not ministering, not law. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Did you have a? Is not first about what we accomplish in ministry. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, ministry or what we know concerning right doctrine. But it is about what spirit it is done in. Not works, not working. See, see, works. Well, that's the law, but not working in a wrong spirit. You see what I mean? That, that can include anything. Well, and that's Jesus. You've heard this said by the law, don't do this, but I say unto you. See, it becomes, you know, the law was hard and nobody could keep it, right? Jesus makes it impossible without his life. Thank God. Or we would be Pharisees. And we would think that we know something. And we would think that we're special. And we wouldn't be poor in spirit. See. All right, so the definition of poor in spirit. The true meaning of poor in spirit is that we are emptied in spirit. We're not full of ourselves. If you're poor financially, you're emptied of finances. <laughs> We are not full of ourselves. We are not proud. We are poor in spirit in that we do not rely on, here we go, we are poor in spirit in that we do not rely on talents. Talents. You go, well, does that mean we can't Use our talents? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that you do not rely on that. Looks. That's one advantage of getting old. <laughs> well, there went another one by the wayside. Uh, special abilities. Special abilities, of course. We wouldn't, you know, we know there's pride there if we call them special abilities. <laughs> and not just, <laughs> I have special abilities. I have superpowers. <laughs> Are you stupid man? I mean superman. Uh, privileges, privileges. All right, come on. Think of Jesus. Think of Paul. Think of Think of Philippians 2, where he had all the rights as God to have all the privileges of God, to settle it once and for all with one quick appearance. Jesus is God and Lord of all, and everyone should bow to him. Boom! The heavens open, the, 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 the skies are rent, Jesus appears in the sky with all the angels and with a glory that is, would just destroy everything evil, if necessary, and everybody go, oh my God, you're, you're the one for sure, because <laughs> none of us can do that. 
but he gave up all privileges and became like us and then as a man became a servant as a servant he became recognized as a criminal and that didn't just happen against his will you know if we're going to know Jesus we're going to have to understand poor in spirit because he's the <laughs> he is that you know that's that I'm not that and you're not that. But if we're going to know Jesus rightly, it's going to have to be a recognition first of him because, you know, all right. The Jesus that, that some are following is a Jesus that would have split the skies and just said, I'm it. And the heck with wasting 2,000 years. Two thousand and sixteen years. Whatever. Yeah. Three weeks. But instead, he didn't do that. He comes down, he shows up, he speaks. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the hungry, blessed are the uh, they, they that mourn. You know? Blessed are you when you're persecuted. What? Is this how we start? You know what I'm saying? Is this, is this how we start? But remember what I said, that all of this began with there has to be an understanding eventually to us that for any of this to be true in us, we have to be dead and Christ has to be our life. Okay. Now, Jesus did teach a whole lot of that, but we didn't get it. I mean, you know, the vine and the branches, you can do nothing. Yes, I can. I can serve you well. I've got special abilities, talents, looks, <laughs> anything, any of that, personality. Intellectual superiority, advantage on any level, Jesus is starting off and saying, okay, all of that, that's out. It's going to take another spirit. See, if you, if you sat there and you went, I can't do that, that's going to take another spirit. <laughs> then you're already on the right track. Even though you're sitting there going, I, I have no hope then. Does that make sense? You, you would, I mean, if you really heard him, you'd go, oh, God, blessed are those that are persecuted. Rejoice. I'm going to kill them for persecuting me to the glory of God, of course. Amen. Raise the banner high and the swords. Ah, freedom! Do you know what Jesus' freedom is? To not use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love, serve. That, that's what it's talking about. Escalations 5, 1, and 13. <clears throat> this does not mean that you do not, you are not in possession of such things, meaning talents, looks, special abilities, privileges, personality advantage, intellectual superiority, success. This does not mean that you're not in possession of such, such things, but all is laid down that our confidence may be in him. And that's what Paul said. I, I am, you know, born of the stock of Benjamin, uh, you know, of Israel, the stock of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee. Of Phar he names off what is gained to him and what gets him you know, in the door when nobody else can get in the door. Well, I'm, you know, I'm this or that or, you know, something impressive, something that will move you, move them, 
And Paul says, what things are gained to me, I count lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things lost for Christ. Why? So that I can be made conformable to his death. See, he said, I want to know him in two things, but he said, here's what I want to happen in me. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. But I want to be made conformable to his death. You can know this and know that and not be conformed to it, but this is what he wants. I want to be made conformable to I, I want to bear about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. I want to be poor in spirit so that I can be filled with him. And when, our, when we're filled with ourselves, he has a hard time getting in. You know? One of the things that upsets people sometimes when they, when they come to this church is that it takes me a long time to release people into ministry. And all of you know that because it's in, that pretty much happened to you. It takes me a long time to release people into ministry because many people find their identity in what they do. And they think they're something, or they become something, or they become important, or they become, well, see, that can't be true in Christ. The only thing that's important is Jesus. That's it. That's it. And so Jesus laid that down, became obedient. To conquer the world. Yes, but no. How did he conquer the world? Again, it's like two mountains and armies on either side and this mad, crazy bunch of wild people with ah, and markings all over them and tattoos. Let's go, go. And they go rushing down to fight Jesus and this little lamb trots out. He's not going to win the way you and I think winning should take place. Right? But he is going to win. But he's not going to win the way that many put it in Christianity, where you just defeat the enemy, you just get stronger, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. But all of the weapons you're giving me basically are defensive weapons. And if you're going to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, the power of his might is the cross. This is the, this, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, what, 5, 6, 7, right in there. Remember that the logos of the cross, you remember that from last class? The logos of the cross that's the power of God. So this doesn't mean that that you are. This does not mean that you are in possession of such that you're, that you're not in possession of such things. But all is laid down that our confidence may be in Him. There is a kenosis or self-emptying that takes place. The Lord's concern here has to do with the spirit of the person and his attitude toward himself as well as this attitude towards others. All right, so we're in a battle every day if you look at it the way the Lord calls a battle. See, we would go, well, I'm in a battle every day because the devil's attacking me or because I, my boss is a not good <laughs> and stuff. You know, and we, get, we, ha you know, we got all these things that we think are the battle. But the Lord, the Lord, here's how he wins battles. His way is by the Lamb, by the nature of His Son. And so we're in battles every day, but we never even know it. We didn't even know that was a battle. Was that a battle? Well, not really, because you got defeated right off the bat by your attitude. 
Meaning you lost the battle. What do you mean I lost it? I yelled at them and they went with, left me with their tail between their legs. I will smite you with the sword of the Lord. Well, right now you need to be smitten with it first. So to, to be empty doesn't mean we're not strong. Jesus showed incredible strength on the cross in terms of forgiving his murderers or showing restraint and not destroying mankind. I mean, he could have called 10,000 angels. You know, does anybody find that a little bit humorous? God doesn't need 10,000 angels. Have you ever seen what he could do with one? And he doesn't even need that one. He's God. They're just angels. He could have just gone, that's it. I've had it. <clears throat> and it's over with. Every evil person would die. Let's see, that would be all of us. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So Jesus showed incredible strength on the cross in terms of forgiving his murderers and showing restraint and not destroying mankind. It is this very strength that we are meant to display also. We are strong in the Lord and the power of his might, but it is a different kind of strength than that which men wish to exercise. Keep your place here, but... Um, Romans, uh, let's see, Romans 15, I think. Yeah, or is it? Why am I having a hard time when I know it's right here? Uh, oh, no wonder. Dummy. I am over here in Corinthians, and I can't find Romans in there. It's just the weirdest thing. That's, it's never happened. I usually find Romans in the book of Corinthians. It is Romans, it is Romans 15, verse 1 through 3. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Okay, so this is, a, this is um, by this point, he doesn't have to explain that you're dead and Christ is your life. Think of Romans 5 or 6 or 7, you know what I mean? There, there shouldn't be any, we, we shouldn't have to go, you have to say it every time, you know? And he shouldn't have to say that to us every time we get in this situation. We should just go, the scripture says this, that's his heart, we're dead, he's our life. Therefore, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, now that's a true statement, but there's also a little bit of a jab in that, in this. The people who are saying they're strong are not strong. They don't know how to be patient. They don't know how to be forgiving. You read the whole thing. 14's a great one to, to see it. It's, you know, you'll see right there. He's not, they're saying they're strong. They're declaring that it's, you know, yeah, we're the strong ones and, and they're the weak ones and they're slowing us down. And we want to get on with the Lord. And we're serious and we mean it. And look, these slackers. Slackers? Slacks? Anyway, these people are slowing us down. Okay, so, so he says, We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. But on another hand, he's not saying that. He is saying, If indeed you are strong, then the kind of strength that you're supposed to be displaying is patience and love and, and being poor in spirit and, and being merciful and, right? That's the kind of strength. 
If you're strong, then this is what you display to the weak. That's what he says right there. And he's basically saying then that if you have another definition of strength here, then that's where we see the problem. It's not, it's not adding up in your mind, but God's talking about this kind of strength. And then, so he says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not please ourselves. If you're strong, then you don't please yourself. You take care of others. You take care of others. And you don't please yourself. Okay, so there's, that, there's the coin again. Anybody see it? Anybody even know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Anybody ever heard this before? Um, it, the coin relates to what you do and what you don't do. You ought to take care of the weak. You ought to not please yourself. All right. If we don't get the coin, or if we got it in that class, but we don't remember it and we don't know how to apply it, then here's what's going to happen. We're going to, if we push past being prideful or whatever, um, and I say prideful, maybe what some people call spiritual pride. I remember that in Bible school. Somebody says, yeah, he's got so much spiritual pride. And I said, then it's not spiritual. That's <laughs> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> anyway, um, then <clears throat> I don't even remember that line I was taking. Anyway, the, that if there is this spiritual pride or this something working in you, then you are not aware of either side of the coin. If you are, let's say you're trying, you're going with the Lord, you're trying to help the weak. You're trying to be strong in the Lord in an attempt to help others. But you still are pleasing yourself then it's not really the fullness of the cross or, or the nature of Christ because, because his nature bears both. It bears both. It has both. And we went through a ton of scriptures. Anybody remember that? We went through a ton of scriptures. And I even let y'all do it. Yes. <laughs> we had fun, right? <laughs> Is that what we got out of this? Fun? <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, so you see it here. All right, but then the next verse, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Okay? So it's not just being a man pleaser. Paul deals with that in Galatians. This is different from being a man pleaser. This is laying down your life or being strong in the nature of the lamb to please others for their good to edification. And the word edification throughout the New Testament is used a lot to identify that, that it's really the Lord. I'm just, it's, a, it's a, like a manifestation or a, a, a key word. It's like a flag that helps us see when it talks about edifying, this is the result of the Lamb because it builds up others. It builds up others. He builds up others even while he's dying, okay? Well, that's, that's what we're called to, okay? And Jesus is starting, he's starting his first big sermon with the first bunch of people with these principles. Isn't that good? Yeah. So, and then verse three, for even Christ pleased not himself. All right, so here we go. Our definition of pleasing not ourself and his definition of not pleasing himself, a lot of times, there's a really big gap between them. We say, I'm not going to eat that cookie right now. I'm with the Lord, or I'm fasting. For Jesus, I will not eat that cookie. And we, and, and we were sincere, I know, but we're, you know, I mean, we think heaven's going, oh, yeah, yeah, oh my God. You know? But listen to this. 
For even Jesus pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. In other words, the way he didn't please himself was by letting everybody blame him, and he took it. But he took it into death so that it would die because he didn't sin, so he's going to come up, and we're going to come up one with him. See? That's the, you know, his version of not pleasing yourself <laughs> is to let everybody accuse you and you take it in the right spirit. But if you're not poor in spirit, you're not going to take it in the right spirit. So, I mean, does, does anybody find it interesting that Jesus starts his first preaching Going, look, your spirit's got to be right, first of all. No need talking about anything else until your spirit's right. You know? Why would he, why would that, why would he say that? Because that's what's important to him. Amen. See, we go, well, if that's, if that's on the number one list of Jesus, then I'm going to do it. Well, it's, what if it's on his heart? What if he wants us to be one with him in this, in, in spirit, and from that, everything come into creation. Spring forth out of that. See. So, bless of the poor in spirit, folks, is huge. It's like an atomic bomb. This is it. Start here and bam. <clears throat> Everything's going to be produced now as a result of this. So Romans 15, I put, we are strong enough to bear the infirmities of the weak. Because <laughs> some people aren't. They're weak. They're not strong enough to bear the infirmities of the weak. Many Christians are so strong that they have no patience for the troubled, the weak, or those who slow them down or get in their way in their pursuit of the Lord get in their way in their pursuit of the Lord, you know. All right, for theirs is the kingdom. Let's go back to Matthew 5, and I just ended up in Ezekiel somehow. There it is. Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right. Theirs is the kingdom. What? Come on, think about it. Anybody? Isn't that the perfect follow-up? Theirs is the kingdom. All right. Well, I know that I know our understanding of that would be, well, if you do this, then you're going to get this. No. He says, if you do this, then yours is already the kingdom. He's not saying you're going to get it. There's no future thing in this. This is, this is what you're doing is proof that you're in the kingdom. All right, so theirs is the kingdom. It's an if issue of what governs. The kingdom is what governs. What governs? Well, in Jesus' kingdom, rules don't govern. Is that right or wrong? Well, brother, I don't know. Uh, you know. I can tell you that in his kingdom, all that are in his kingdom are one with him. And if you're one with him, you're one with his nature. You're one with his life. You're not an independent being that needs rules. Let this mind be in you. What mind? This ruler mind! You know? Don't worry, don't cry, don't cry. The lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered and won. Don't, don't worry, Just wipe your tears, it's okay. Well, where, where is he? He's right over here, he's on the throne. What? And I looked, and behold, a little lamb as though it had been slaughtered. 
Slaughtered, that's the actual Greek word there. A slaughtered little lamb. A little premature. The preemie dead lamb. As innocent as it gets and yet totally conqueror. We we hear those words, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, Jesus was that. And he was the fulfillment of that. And nobody else was. And he conquered through death. And it says that. All those people that are around him, even there in that same area, are worshiping the lamb. And they say, worthy is the lamb that was slain. To receive. Didn't say worthy is the one that was slain, but got up and slapped the enemy down like the dogs that they were. It doesn't. It says, worthy is the lamb that was slain. And because he was slain in this spirit to, to receive glory and honor. Wherefore, anybody remember that word? Where does it come from? What? We got nothing on this. <laughs> that that he, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore? And Philippians 2 does not mention salvation or any benefits to anybody. It is God identifying the nature of his son, not what it accomplished. And he says, because of that, Wherefore? All right. So you, that, you see that in the book of Revelation then. You see that when it says the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it's meant to shock everybody. It's meant to. Amen. It's in there to shock. It's supposed to shock us. It's a, anybody ever been shocked? Yes. Anybody ever been stuck your finger in a dinner or whatever, you know, and, and gotten an electric shock? It was, <laughs> oh. You know? It's meant, you know, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. And I turned and I looked. And if you don't turn and look, you'll go by your own understanding and the understanding of the world. You will do it and you'll do it every time. You must realize that there, there has to be a, a turning, a turning. A desire to see, not just hear things. I want to see this. I want to see it. I don't want to have someone else tell me about it. I want to see this. And I want to turn from that saying, that phrase, and see what God has in mind when he calls it that. So you turn from it. Lion of the tribe of Judah, I'm turning from that. And if I see Lion of the tribe of Judah on the throne over here, then okay, I'll match him up. But he turns and he goes, my God, what? What? That's, that's it? That's the one on the throne of heaven? That's the one God exalted and said, I have given you a name that is above every name. Yeah. And every knee shall bow. Now, folks, that's in Philippians 2, and he's talking about the lamb there. He didn't use his name, but that when he talks about he, he thought it not something to be grasped after and goes down and gets lower and lower and lower and lower, wherefore God highly exalts him, and every knee in heaven and in earth and under the earth will bow to this slaughtered lamb. This Philippians 2, 5 through 8, lamb. Okay. All right. Well, one thing you need to remember. The lamb in the earth. Same lamb. Lamb in the earth and the lamb in heaven. The lamb in the earth is here to lay down its life. And the lamb in heaven will be exalted. Okay? Uh, that's a very important thing. 
it'll, it'll explain a lot of things to you when, when you're going through stuff, you know. And any time the lamb is in the earth, the enemy is on the prowl to try to destroy. Did you realize that? Yeah. All right. Let me just spot where I'm at here. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, we'll take a break and we'll come back. <laughs>